Up on stage, we have a returning goon who uh, wants to uh, demystify some, uh, some vulnerabilities and, and why they're mystifying. I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> the words in front of me. But um, reverse engineering the eternal exploits. Who's excited about this? I see the room is getting pretty packed. <laughs> Life! There's people alive in here. That's wonderful. All right, with no further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Zero Sum Zero X Zero. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so from a, a show of hands, how many people uh, uh, popped the shell with MS-1710 over the past year and a half? Yeah. <laughs> how many people are finding it everywhere, right? Uh, how many people uh, helped with uh, WannaCry and NetPetya and the cleanups of those, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, like I said, it's been a year and a half since they got introduced. We're still finding them everywhere on our red team. It's a path to glory on our pen tests. Um, before I do get started, uh, this is uh, top secret information classified on, we don't know exactly what it is, but uh, it's allegedly from the NSA, uh, stolen from the NSA. Uh, so if you have a clearance, uh, Francis uh, CKRS it was at DerbyCon last year, he gave a uh, talk on dander spritz and he gave a disclaimer, so I thought I would give one too. Um, so everyone leaving the room right now is a Fed, and uh, you should <laughs> keep track of their names. <laughs> and you're all stuck for 45 minutes. Um, so I did have to cut a lot from this presentation uh, that I wanted to go over, um, just because of time. Uh, the goon probably will hook me off stage in a little bit here, <laughs> uh, but hopefully we can get through it. Um, so if anyone's not aware, uh, the equation group is the tailored access operations at a former uh, department at the NSA uh, that wrote um, a bunch of exploits. Um, and uh, they've never really gotten a lot of public credit, but uh, just like hacker to hacker, uh, and all the politics and everything aside, and just looking at the technicals, uh, it's a very talented uh, team. And so they deserve a lot of uh, credit. Um, and then the shadow brokers, uh, we don't really know who they are. Uh, there's some evidence that they might be Russia. Uh, they claim they're an inside job if you read their messages. Uh, but they came around uh, and started dumping uh, these exploits uh, about a year and a half ago over the course of you know, a couple of years uh, it's been going on. They've been pretty quiet for the past year or so, though. Um, so I'm going to try and get through SMB uh, internals real quick, and then we can get into the uh, eternal exploits, which are all uh, SMB v1 vulnerabilities. Um, so SMB was invented in 1983 by a guy named Barry Feigenbaum uh, at IBM. He also worked on the NetBIOS, RFCs, and stuff like that. Uh, we originally saw it. There was a product from Microsoft called Land Manager. It was later built into Windows, and pretty much all modern versions of Windows have SMB uh, built in. And it's a very extensible protocol, so you can build things on top of it. And so uh, that's where we get things like PS exec. Uh, running on top of the distributed computing environments remote procedure call uh, using SMB as a transport. Um, so SMB v1 uh, looks, uh, this is kind of the packet layout uh, that you would expect to see from a normal SMB, a well-formed SMB. Um, so normally you'll send a message block request, um, and then if the server processes that request, it'll send you an SMB reply. Um, so both uh, replies and responses look very similar. Um, they have a command, which is like the opcode, hundreds of commands in SMB v1. Um, there's a flags field, which tells you, is this a request or a reply? Um, are we talking Unicode, that kind of thing? Um, if you're getting a response from the server and it wasn't able to process that SMB, there was an error, uh, it'll set an error number for you. Uh, this is also where SMB signing is uh, located. And then there's the user ID, tree ID, process ID, and multiplex ID, which we will talk a little bit more about later. Um, and SMB also has a parameter block. So depending on what that opcode is, there's going to be a structure associated um, with that opcode. And that's generally where the, uh, it's gonna, that structure is going to end up in the parameter block. So it's a fixed size depending on the opcode usually. Um, then data block uh, is just arbitrary data associated with the command. So if you think about it uh, this way, if uh, you're like creating a file, your command is like create file or whatever, um, the parameter block will be uh, like the file name, uh, attributes, and then the data block would be like the file data. If you want to think about it that way, it's kind of an oversimplification, but it works. 
Um, so SMBv1 has DLC. So uh, the later version you have, the more features you unlock. Um, pretty much all of these features have been available um, in the latest version, or since the earliest versions of NT. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, all these exploits, they date back to the uh, early 90s um, before NT was really officially even released uh, and late 80s. Um, so the main driver that all these vulnerabilities are going to be in is the service.sys driver, which is the SMB v1 driver. Uh, those, have done, those who have done um, low-level, uh, high-concurrent networking uh, will be familiar with a uh, pattern called uh, load balancer. And uh, so what you're doing is you have producers uh, taking the network traffic and then consumer threads that are uh, eating that traffic. Um, so we're working with queues um, from computer science, you know, first in, first out uh, container. <clears throat> and this is because SMB is de designed for speed. Um, and what you're actually producing and consuming are these things called work contexts, uh, which is, so there's hundreds of SMBs. Uh, and all of them can be kind of pigeonholed into this mega C structure um, called a work context, uh, and that's what's being processed. Uh, but the really important thing to uh, note on this slide is that um, when the server receives an SMB request and it's going to process the response to you, um, an SMB can be sent to the back of a queue multiple times while it's being processed. Um, and so there's two different types of queues. There's the normal queue coming off the network, and then if something's going to take a really long time, uh, it'll get sent to a blocking work queue. Um, in Vista, they introduced SMB2, uh, and they took, they stripped the networking portion out of the serve-sys driver and put it in a driver called servenet.sys. Um, so this is what's actually binding um, the SMB ports. And then serve.sys and serve2.sys come along, and they register callbacks uh, with that driver. And so when network traffic comes in, they inspect the, uh, the SMB and they're like, that looks like SMB1. Uh, my driver can process that and then uh, that happens. Uh, there's only a few SMBs that are of interest. Um, in the negotiate stage, we pick our SMB dialect, uh, either that NTLM or Cairo, um, and the server will make this connection uh, struct. Later when we go to log in, it's called a session setup. Um, the server will create this structure called a session. It'll have a pointer to that connection. It'll also have our username, our user domain. Uh, at this point, the server will assign us a user ID. Um, and when we log in, uh, when we do the session setup, we tell the server um, a max buffer size that uh, our SMB client is able to process. Um, so we say if a SMB response is going to be bigger than this max buffer size, uh, send it to us in a multi-part SMB. Um, and so mainly what you're doing with SMB is connecting to uh, trees, uh, which are basically shares. Uh, there's one that we're going to be connecting to in all these exploits. I mean, you can connect to any tree, but the one that's usually open for anonymous logins is the inner process communication share. And when you connect to a tree, uh, like that IPC share, uh, the server will assign you a tree ID. Um, so now I'm going to talk about transactions, which are a special subset of SMBs. Uh, that are what all these exploits take advantage of. Um, so a transaction, you can think of it as like an IOCTL. Uh, they perform a variety of functions. Most of them are file uh, system based. Uh, but what's interesting about transactions is they can be split apart across multiple uh, SMBs. Um, so you'll send the primary transaction. It'll be, I have you know, this much data to send you. Um, the server will send an interim response saying, OK, I accept that. Um, send me the rest of it. Then you'll send a bunch of secondary transactions filling out uh, that uh, whatever data you say you're going to be sending. And then when it finally gets all of them, that's when it's going to process and send a response to you, uh, which can be broken up uh, as well. Uh, but it's kind of like a database transaction. You know, like it's an atomic thing as soon as that uh, uh, last secondary transaction comes in. That's, that's when it's going to be processed. <clears throat> Um, so a transaction is kind of like a, a message block inside of the server message blocks. Um, so in addition to the SMB parameter block and the SMB data block, uh, you'll also have the transaction parameter block and the transaction data block. Um, there's different types of transactions over the years. 
so trans and trans one, uh, as I might refer to it, uh, is old stuff like mail slots and the re remote access protocol. Um, trans two introduced uh, support for greater than uh, the old DOS style 8.3 short names. Um, and you'll see a lot of OS2 to NT uh, conversion stuff in there. Um, and then NT trans, uh, the parameter and data block uh, sizes were changed from shorts to longs. So that's the, the major difference there. And they all have uh, different dispatch tables um, that perform different functions. Um, so when you send a uh, primary transaction, um, you'll have the parameter offset and the data offset as part of that uh, SMB. Um, that just tells uh, the server how far into that SMB um, the trans data and parameter blocks actually begin. Um, there'll be a count, so that's how much data and parameter you're sending uh, per this SMB. Total count is how much we're expecting between all primary and secondary uh, SMBs, uh, transaction SMBs. And then the max count is we're telling the server uh, if you're going to send us a reply for this transaction, this is the uh, buffer size that we're going to uh, reserve for that response, so don't uh, send us more than that. Uh, when we send our secondary transactions, a lot of the fields are the same, except for now there's a displacement uh, field. And that's, uh, so as we're sending, you know, piecemeal uh, transaction data, uh, we need to tell the server where in the buffer it needs to write this packet at, because uh, it's not keeping track of that. That's our job to do as a client. Uh, part of the problem, really. Um, and so when you do create a uh, transaction, uh, when you send a primary transaction, um, the server will create a transaction structure. Uh, you can see we have pointers to our connection, our session, and our tree connect. Um, then you'll see we have uh, buffers um, for the incoming parameters, the outgoing parameters, the incoming data, and the outgoing data. Um, a lot of times the server will reuse uh, the same buffers, so the request buffer, uh, it's you know, smart about it. It doesn't make two allocations. Not always, but uh, sometimes. And then you'll see a transaction also has a tree ID, um, a process ID, and a user ID. So I talked about user ID and uh, uh, tree ID, but process ID is just our client saying uh, any random number, really. Uh, but that's like our process. Um, so when we allocate or when we send a primary transaction, the server will call a function called serve allocate transaction. And yeah, and the nice thing about this driver is uh, a lot of the symbol names are uh, available through uh, PDB uh, files on the, the TechNet servers. Um, so it'll allocate a transaction. Um, generally, the minimum size is going to be OX5000, and the reason for that is it's going to grab it from a memory look side list. Um, not always. Um, and then the maximum allocation size is going to be OX10400, uh, generally. Uh, Otherwise, you'll get an error saying you tried to make a transaction that's too big. When we send secondary transactions, um, that transaction is already allocated, uh, so it's going to go call a function called find transaction, and it's going to look it up by our user ID, our tree ID, our process ID, um, and then we have this other info field, which is generally uh, going to be a multiplex ID, which is just another random number um, that we can send as the client. And that lets us have multiple transactions going, and the server know which ones uh, we're actually talking about when we send transaction packets. Um, another thing to uh, notice is that all of these structures that I talked about are reference counted. Um, so if you want to think about it like, uh, like C++ smart pointers, only like done in C, uh, when you reference it, a uh, number goes up. When you dereference, it goes down. And then uh, eventually, when you hit zero, it gets freed automatically. And so that should be enough background. <laughs> um, so there's a concept with files called extended attributes. And so this is just name, value, uh, key pairs, uh, metadata attached to files. Um, the concept was introduced in OS2 1.2, which is an old uh, Microsoft uh, IBM operating system. They had the high performance file system. Um, Windows NT, we don't really see extended attributes uh, that much anymore. Uh, there's a thing called alternate data streams, uh, which most malware analysts are probably aware of. Um, but one thing I was reading, a modern use of extended attributes is for the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, they use it to um, store like file permissions and case sensitivity data. And then in SMB parlance, there's fee um, and gee. Uh, 
So phi means uh, the structure has both name and value, and gi, uh, or full extended attribute. And then gi is a get extended attribute, which is just the name. So you might send a gi to get a phi. So here's what the OS2 fee structure looks like. Um, it starts with the flags field, which is either zero or 80. Zero means uh, this fee or this extended attribute is not really that important. OX80 means uh, if you're gonna copy this to a file system that doesn't know extended attributes, uh, think twice, because uh, it's an important extended attribute. Um, and then it has a count of bytes for the name field, and then a count of bytes for the value field. Um, then immediately following that, it'll have um, a buffer, or it'll store um, the name field, which is a C string, so it's null terminated, and then the value is not null terminated because it can be just arbitrary binary data. Uh, but a, one extended attribute by itself isn't very useful, so you'll usually find them in a fee list. Um, so this structure has the count of bytes of the entire list, um, and then a bunch of those fee. And then you can get the size of the fee, uh, its name plus its value, uh, plus the size of the structure. And you can loop over this uh, uh, fee list structure and read each individual fee. With Windows NT, they, uh, they added extended attributes, but they changed the structure a little bit. Um, so you see we still have flags, uh, we still have a name length, and we still have a value length. And then we have uh, the name buffer and the value buffer afterwards. Um, and then there's an alignment. Uh, they align it to D word. I guess certain, maybe certain CPU architectures they wanted to support uh, needed that alignment or something. Um, but there is no separate fee list structure. There's just this next entry offset. So you parse a list of fees uh, until uh, that next entry offset is zero. So parsing it's a little different. Um, here's the side of the bug of Eternal Blue, uh, the main bug, anyways. Um, what this function is doing is it's calculating uh, when we send a OS2 fee list over the network, um, the server needs to convert that into an NT fee list. Um, so this is just calculating how much uh, uh, size it needs to reserve in memory. And then uh, on that vulnerable line of code, what it's doing is if the size of our OS2 fee list that we sent is bad, it's going to try and fix it for us. Um, I don't know why it doesn't just reject the packet there. Uh, might be supporting older clients or something. Uh, but I mentioned that the count of bytes of the fee list is a U long. Um, what you saw there was it's putting it into a U short. Um, so it's casting it wrong. Um, so if I, as an attacker, say, um, here's OX 10,000 bytes of fee list, uh, then my high D word is set. Uh, when the, that function comes along and it says, oh, I only see FF5D valid um, fee list there. When it casts incorrectly, um, you see that that high D word is still set, and the si it thinks the size of the buffer is bigger than it really is. And then uh, when it calculates the size that it needs to reserve from the NT buffer, it's only going from the uh, from the correct uh, casted variable. Uh, but. Uh, here's what it looks like in code. Uh, most people will probably be familiar with x86, x64. Uh, you can see that we're working with uh, D word registers, and then at the side of the vulnerability, uh, it's moving a word pointer. Um, uh, so I'm going to explain the same thing, just a little bit more clear here. Um, so as an attacker, I'm supplying this fee list um, in an SMB, um, and I say, here's my OX 10,000 sized uh, uh, fee list. Then you'll see there's a bunch of uh, what I'm referring to as null fee, uh, and that's just where the name and the value are both zero. Um, it's an exercise for you to figure out why that would be the most efficient way, but uh, basically five bytes of OS2 fee here become 12 bytes of NT fee, because there's more data in NT fee. And so this really is the most efficient way uh, to pack it. Um, but then as it's parsing through all the fees, it gets to the end of uh, this Buffalo overflow fee, and it sees that the start of that fee plus the length of that fee um, exceeds the list, uh, the CB list size, uh, the ROX 10,000. So it says, I'm going to do a great job and correct that for you. And then I'm going to reserve an NT buffer. Um, so then in another function after these buffer sizes have been uh, calculated, uh, it's going to go through and it's going to copy each fee one by one, uh, doing the conversion to NT fee. 
Um, and then when it gets to that buffer over low fee, it's gonna exceed that buffer. Um, and then you can see if we keep copying, we're gonna hit uh, unallocated space and crash the target. Um, so we can send an invalid fee. That's just where uh, the flags are not zero or 80. Um, and when we send that, we'll get a uh, SMB error um, from the server uh, that's uh, invalid parameter. And so that's a really good sign for us. That means that the uh, overflow fee happened. We didn't crash immediately. Uh, you know, we may not be Gucci, but it might uh, still crash later, but. Um, so we're looking for the path of least resistance to trigger this bug. Um, some, uh, some of the functions that call these vulnerable functions uh, require a little bit more access um, or uh, access to name pipes. Uh, so this trans to open to is the best way to do it. Um, you're opening a file, but you're also creating one. Uh, it's, and uh, you can see that it takes a uh, extended attributes list um, for that. And so you can set most of this packet, or uh, this SMB to uh, just saying default values and then put your exploit fee list there. <clears throat> um, another thing, uh, another bug, um, like I said, um, we're sending a greater than OX 10,000 data, um, but with a trans2 request, uh, data and parameter blocks are only word sized. Um, so what's going on here, um, if you look at the Wireshark capture, um, it, it's first opening with an NT uh, primary transaction and then it's sending trans to secondary transactions. Um, so the bug is it doesn't matter what your primary transaction is, it doesn't matter what your secondary transactions are, except for that last one, uh, when the transaction gets executed, that's when it's going to choose the dispatch table. Um, so we can reserve, uh, since NT allows us to do uh, uh, D word sized um, parameter and data blocks, uh, that's, we can use this to help us trigger the bug. Um, there's another problem with uh, session setup allocations. Um, so there's many different ways to log in to SMB. Uh, at least two ways are NT security and extended security. Um, and depending on the flags of the SMB, uh, you can actually um, confuse the server and it'll read uh, from the wrong uh, offset where it should be allocating the size of that SMB's data block. Um, so this bug doesn't really let you do much in terms of exploitation, it does help you groom the pool, uh, which we're gonna get into. But uh, uh, basically lets us reserve a large amount of memory, and then uh, if we close that connection, it'll free that memory immediately. Um, and this is still in the master branch of Windows. Uh, pretty sure they still haven't fixed it. Uh, but like I said, it's not really a vulnerability, it's just weird quirk. <clears throat> so now we have all of the ingredients we need uh, for Eternal Blue. Uh, we have the exploit uh, connection. Uh, so we're gonna be opening many connections to the server during the exploitation process. Uh, on one connection, we're gonna be sending the exploit. Um, on different connections, we're gonna be sending uh, uh, that session setup bug that lets us reserve large amounts of memory. Um, we're gonna make an allocation and a whole connection. Um, and then what we're actually gonna try and uh, overflow into is um, a servnet.sys network buffer. Um, so when servnet.sys sees network traffic, it's not just a buffer, right? It's the structure um, and then a buffer uh, that follows it. Um, and we're trying to overflow into that structure, at least for Windows 7. Windows 10, it gets a little weird. Um, but we're gonna send primary grooms, secondary grooms. They look like SMB2 packets, uh, so there was a little confusion um, in the early reporting uh, that some of these bugs were SMB2 and 3. Uh, they're all SMB1, but uh, uh, it's before like uh, serve nets, does callbacks and either serve two or serve one handle it. Um, the only thing that I've seen a uh, credible claim is that it might be an IDS bypass because eventually after we overflow these uh, serve net uh, structures, we're gonna send them to the shell code and all that over it. Um, so maybe if it looks like SMB2, uh, that was an attempt at an IDS bypass. Um, so before we start the exploitation process, there's a uh, uh, serve net uh, the network buffers, they have look aside memory, and then there's just gonna be random stuff in the pool. Uh, the first step is we're going to send um, our primary exploit transaction and all of the exploit transactions uh, with the fee list in it, um, except for the last one. Uh, so nothing really going on in memory yet. Uh, just as soon as we send that last transaction, uh, it'll trigger the bug and do the overflow. We don't wanna do it yet because we haven't groomed the pool. <clears throat> 
Uh, then we're going to send uh, the initial grooms. So these are just uh, basically naked SMB. Uh, it's before either SMB 1 or 2 takes over. Um, and what we're trying to do here is force uh, new pool allocations. Um, then we send, uh, uh, open a new connection with the, uh, that allocation bug. Uh, we don't, we were going to reserve a large memory block, but it's not going to be the same size as our incorrectly calculated NT buffer. We're going to send a whole buffer. Uh, so this is the exact same size that the uh, NT fee buffer, uh, eventually the, the incorrect sizes. Uh, we want it to fit in this hole. Next, we're going to close the allocation connection. Uh, this lets uh, just random stuff in the pool uh, come along and allocate memory without messing up our uh, uh, exploitation process. Then we're going to send the secondary grooms to look exactly like the primary grooms. We're just hoping that one ends up after the whole connection there. And then we're going to free the whole connection and we're going to send the last uh, exploit uh, transaction. And that's going to think it can fit in that hole. And then during the memory copy, when it's parsing all the fee, uh, it's going to overflow into the headers uh, of the next. Uh, so what are we actually overflowing here? Um, like I said, it's not just a buffer. Um, there's a structure, a couple structures. Um, you'll see there's a MDL, which is a uh, memory descriptor list. It's a common uh, NT uh, structure that lets you map uh, virtual memory to physical memory. Um, so we can overwrite that one of those MDLs, uh, and depending on what address we get it, that's a write what where primitive. Uh, once we overwrite that MDL, any network traffic we send over that connection, um, instead of going to the buffer, it's going to go to uh, wherever we overwrote. Um, so the HAL heap until the the very latest versions of Windows 10, uh, they were not ASLR, um, and on Windows 7, it's not DEP either. <coughs> Um, and then you'll see we are, we're also overflowing a uh, pointer to this uh, WSK WinSock structure. Um, we point that pointer um, at the HAL heap uh, as well, and then we uh, send a fake structure, which I'll do on the next slide. Um, and then we also send our shellcode at this time. Um, so that fake structure that we overwrote um, has a function table um, as the most important member that we're worried about. Everything else, same defaults. Um, now we, so we send the shell code to all of those uh, primary grooms and secondary grooms. They're all separate connections. Um, we don't know which one actually got overflowed to the right what where primitive. Um, so we close all of the uh, groom connections. And then uh, they're going to go through and they're going to uh, call these uh, uh, handlers for when the uh, connection closes. And eventually it's going to hit the function table. Uh, which we have conveniently pointed the cleanup function to point at the address of the shell code, um, which is on the HAL heap. Um, but it's still not that simple because um, in eternal blue at that point, uh, we're operating at dispatch level in the kernel, which means that a lot of uh, common functionality uh, libraries and stuff uh, or functions exported are off limits because we don't have access to things like paged memory. Um, so one of the quickest and dirtiest ways that you can get from dispatch level to passive level is to hook the syscall table. Um, then the next time um, a syscall happens, uh, um, instead of going to the normal syscall handler, it'll come to our function. Um, we'll transition gracefully from user mode. You know, we'll set up the kernel stack and all that. Um, and then we'll run the main stage, right, the, the double pulsar backdoor, which is going to backdoor um, the serve transaction to dispatch table. Um, and then after we're done running double pulsar, we will restore the syscall handler. And I'm going to go into double pulsar a, a little bit uh, later. Uh, but basically, here's the patch. Um, they just fixed that cast from a short to a long. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and yeah, all these are patches are one-liners. Um, so eternal champion um, transactions. If I try to send um, secondary transactions um, after a transaction's already executing, um, it'll have this uh, executing boolean uh, locking mechanism set. Uh, so before it executes a transaction, it's going to set that locked variable to true. Um, and then if I send a secondary, it's just going to reject it. Um, except if I have a primary transaction where I send all of my um, data and parameter in one primary transaction, I don't really need a secondary transaction. Uh, the bug is they forgot to set that lock. Um, so then, um, while that transaction is executing, we can come on by and send secondary transactions and actually modify uh, the data of that primary uh, transaction. 
Um, so this gives us an info leak on a single core processor, and then there's a stack overwrite um, that seems to only be triggered on multi-core. And uh, I believe it's eternal champion because champions win races, and this is basically a race condition. Um, so in order to uh, uh, perform uh, the exploitation, uh, we need to uh, leak a transaction. We need kernel addresses, that kind of thing. Um, so there's another, uh, so the first thing we can do with this race condition um, is we can look for an SMB which echoes data back. Um, on older versions of Windows, the remote access protocol has uh, WNet account sync and NetServer enum2. Those will echo data back to us. Um, on every version of uh, NT, you have NT rename. Uh, the only difference is that uh, that requires a valid file ID, so you have to open a name pipe. Um, and so there's a little bit more permissions associated with that. Um, but basically, all we're going to do is we're going to send um, a primary uh, transaction uh, where the data is greater than Jesus. Sorry, I spilled some water up here. just in case you needed a, a quick review. Um, so we send a primary transaction where the amount of data in that is greater than when we uh, logged in with the session setup. Uh, we told it it's max buffer size that we can expect for a reply. Um, so the amount of data it needs to echo back to us can't fit in one reply. So it's gonna send it to the back of a, a work queue. Um, and then while it gets sent to the back of the work queue, we can have another secondary transaction come in and uh, modify the uh, amount of data, the data count on it. Um, and then just because there's bad uh, validation, uh, this does let us, uh, when it goes to read uh, data back to us, it'll read past the buffer um, into another transaction. Um, so here's the uh, code execution path. Um, so there's a uh, uh, transaction, I believe two, called query path information. And part of its parameter block um, has a sub command um, so the first step we're going to do with that subcommand is we're going to say I want to query an extended attribute size, and that's going to send us to the back of a blocking work queue. Um, so when we send secondary transactions, we're on the normal work queue, and then the transaction is also being processed on a blocking work queue. Um, the second step um, is so after we've triggered that, um, we have the, another transaction secondary come by that modifies the parameter block, uh, the transaction parameter block. Um, and then we change the subcommand to a is name valid. Um, and this is pointing at a stack variable now. Uh, it changes our end data pointer to a stack variable. Um, and so uh, with that end data pointer uh, pointed at a stack variable using uh, data displacement, uh, we can get past things like stack canaries and stuff, and we can overwrite uh, our return address to our worker thread uh, with a secondary transaction. Um, sorry, running low on time already. Uh, so basically, uh, when we send uh, this exploitation sequence, it's going to be eight SM SMBs and one TCP packet. Uh, the first one's going to be that query EA size, uh, primary with all of the data and all the parameter. And so that's going to cause uh, the blocking work queue uh, to be triggered. And then we're going to send um, a transaction secondary that changes it to the is name valid subcommand, which is making a point at a stack variable. And then we're going to send um, six. Uh, transaction to secondaries with a data displacement that's going to overwrite uh, the return address. Uh, but it's race condition, so we send eight packets per exploitation attempt. Uh, so we attempt, we see if double pulsar has been installed, um, and if it hasn't, we run it 42 times uh, by default. Um, when we get code execution, um, on a depth thing, uh, if the thing has depth, we'll search the uh, connection transaction list. Uh, we're looking for a special identifier at the start of one transaction. Um, and so this is basically an egg hunter. Uh, so we're gonna store the shell code. Um, at this point, we have access to allocation functions of the pool, so we will copy the payload um, from that egg and then run it. Uh, then we will uh, increment uh, uh, the amount of available threads on one of the structures that we uh, get passed into our shell code. Um, and then we can resume execution uh, with a little uh, NT magic. Uh, so there's the processor control region, which is a global variable um, in the kernel. Uh, just going from there, we can get to the current thread start address and then just jump to it 
and uh, resume execution in the worker thread loop. Um, so here's the patch for eternal champion. Uh, this is primary transaction. If all data was received, it began executing the transaction. After the patch, it set that executing variable to true. That's it. Um, so I talked about uh, when secondary transactions come by, instead of allocating a transaction, it's looking up a transaction. Um, generally, it's going to be a randomly generated multiplex ID, but there's a special SMB called a write index. And if you open it, a file in raw mode uh, with write index, um, it makes a transaction instead of uh, whatever they do for everything else. Um, and, with SM and with this weird uh, pseudo transaction, that's not really a transaction, um, as they're copying data that you're sending to write to that file, um, they'll increment the end data pointer of the transaction. Um, so we can uh, cause a type confusion sequence here. Um, so we do an NT create index for opening a named pipe. Uh, the server assigns us a file ID. Then we're going to create um, just a normal everyday transaction, nothing special. Um, but we're going to set our multiplex ID to the same as that file ID that just got assigned by the server. And so the uh, server's going to allocate a transaction. Then we're going to do that write index uh, request uh, with the FID. It's going to see, oh, yeah, there's a transaction, a, a, a transaction there. Uh, and it's going to increment that data, that end data buffer pointer. Um, so this is going to allow us to shift the pointer. Um, so what we're going to do first is we're going to groom the pool. So there's an exploit transaction and then a victim transaction right after it. Um, normally our transaction end data pointer will only be able to, uh, using displacement and all that, we can only access our, uh, our data buffer. Um, but after we do the, uh, the shift, uh, that pointer got incremented, so if we send a secondary transaction now, uh, we can write past our buffer. Um, so there's a, another bug that lets us get an info leak, because uh, again, we need kernel addresses, that kind of thing. Um, so normally, trans peak named pipe, you're just peaking a named pipe. It expects the max parameter count to be 16, but it takes the client value. Um, so if we are allocating from a look aside list, uh, we can set that max parameter count to most of that OX5000. Um, and then we'll set the max data count to one, you know, just a really tiny value. Um, then because there's bad uh, checking and uh, the way that it writes, uh, uh, where it writes the data um, when you're peaking that named pipe, um, basically if we can put greater than one data uh, to be caused into that named pipe, um, then it'll be, uh, uh, it'll just read past the buffer when it replies to us. Um, so there's different uh, ways that we can groom the pool. Um, fish in a barrel affects older versions of Windows. Uh, I think it's up through Vista. But basically what it was doing is when the serve.sys driver started up, it would um, create a pre-allocated uh, heap. Um, and so with a pre-allocated uh, chunk of memory, we're not fighting other drivers and stuff. We're not going to the pool. Uh, so it's really convenient. Um, it's also great because this private heap is only for very specific MS wrap transactions, which are very rarely used these days. Uh, so it's a very straightforward um, heap feng shui. And that's what it looks like. Um, we're sending victim transactions. They're called fish. And then we have um, a dynamite, which is just a transaction that uh, with the MID set to the FID, so it's eligible for that pointer shift. Um, and then we'll just send more victims. We'll send another dynamite in case the first one failed for whatever reason. So it'll just groom the pool that way and then uh, attempt exploitation. Um, matched pairs is uh, all versions of Windows, um, including 7 plus. Um, so when they remove fish in a barrel, that private heap, uh, you still have this groom available. Uh, the only difference is that instead of having that private heap that no one's using, uh, now we have to go to the normal page pool, um, which is what everybody, uh, every process, everybody, everybody wants page pool. Uh, so it's very contentious. Um, so this is a little oversimplification just for time and space of the slide. Um, but we're going to send these groom transactions, and uh, they're going to take up um, pretty much as much as they can of several pages. Um, and then on that last page, it's going to leave a little bit of extra space at the end. And so that creates a special kind of pool called a frag pool. Um, and so this is, we're just uh, filling up memory at this point. Then we send um, uh, exploit uh, uh, something eligible for that pointer shift, and there's a little extra going on there, but 
Uh, basically, yeah, we just send uh, an exploit uh, pointer shift thing. And uh, then we come along with the brides, which are specifically designed to fill that gap. And so we're, we're only sending like 10 or so grooms. We send 48 brides. Uh, and we're hoping that one of those brides uh, ends up after one of our exploit uh, pointers inside that frag. Um, so now that we have the pointer shift and we can write into one of these victim transactions, uh, we can create a write what where primitive out of it. Uh, uh, basically, we modify, um, using our exploit transaction that's been shifted, we modify our victim transaction, um, its end data pointer. Uh, we point it to where we want to write. We set that executing variable to false, uh, some other clerical things. Um, also increase the ref uh, reference count of the uh, smart pointer type thing. Um, and then when we send a victim transaction secondary, um, that whatever's in our data block is what we actually want to write. Um, read where um, we modify the victim transaction to point at the leak transaction. Um, and we can get the address of the leak transaction. We can infer its address by its contents. Um, this time we set the out data pointer from where we want to read. Um, we change its setup to a peak name pipe, and then we set max data count to how much data we want to read. Uh, then we send a leak uh, trans uh, secondary, and it will echo back out data, which is pointing from where we want to read. Uh, so we have read write primitives. We're on a quest to find somewhere to store the shell code. Um, if we set the victim transactions out parameters to null, and then we send a secondary uh, transaction, uh, it'll change that out parameters to uh, point at the work context uh, response buffer, which is read write x memory. Um, and then we can use the read primitive to read the address that just got set, and the write primitive to write the shell code to that location. Um, and now we're on a quest to execute the shell code. Um, so this is uh, a similar methodology to what Double Pulsar is doing, only we're doing it remotely. Um, so we read in our leaked transaction. Uh, it has that connection pointer on it. We read in from that connection pointer. Uh, it has a variable called endpoint spin lock, and that's pointing to a global variable in the serve.sys driver um, inside of that PE's data section. Um, so let me just read backwards in memory. Um, we're looking for a special table called the serve SMB word count. Um, so uh, the word counts associated with the size of uh, transaction or uh, SMB parameters. Um, so this is a table that's about 256 entries, but it only has 100 commands. Um, so anything that's not a, a legal command is going to be a negative 2 in this table, um, which is OXFE. So when you see a bunch of Fifi when you're <laughs> reading uh, the thing, uh, you know you're getting close. Uh, and then so immediately following that will be the transaction to dispatch table. Um, and then uh, offsets 14 and 15 into that table uh, are not implemented. Um, and we can overwrite. Um, OX14, which is uh, with uh, the address of the shell code. And then we send a transaction that triggers that uh, dispatch table to be called. Um, so here's how they patch the info leak. Um, before the max parameter count was either the user supplied max parameter count or 16. After the patch, they made it always 16. And this is how MS1710 scanners, uh, one way you can write one. Uh, um, so I mentioned before that when you allocate a transaction, if it's greater than OX10400, uh, you'll get a status insufficient server resources. Um, so what we'll do is we'll send a, a transaction where the max parameter count and the max data count is going to be greater. Uh, the, the sum of those is greater than that OX10400. Um, before the patch, it will re reject that packet and send us that status insufficient server resources. After the patch, it's going to fix that uh, max parameter count to 16. Um, and so now it will do a proper allocation. Uh, we'll get a little bit further and get a different error message. And so that's how uh, you can tell if the target's been patched. Um, so here's another thing they fixed was if the data count in the named pipe is greater than the max data count, uh, the, the size of the client buffer, uh, they'll just uh, fix that. Um, here's the remote code execution before the patch and after the patch. Um, so before the patch, remember, it was uh, shifting that pointer uh, during a uh, write index. After the patch, instead of shifting the pointer, they're just um, using an offset uh, during the copy. Um, another thing they did to fix remote code execution, and this does help with Eternal Blue as well, is now when you allocate a transaction, uh, you set what you, uh, the expected secondary command should be. 
Um, and then later when you go to find a transaction, it sees if that new incoming uh, tra secondary transaction, uh, if that command matches up with the same uh, expected secondary command. And if not, it won't return it. Um, so now we can get into eternal synergy. Uh, so this has the same uh, buffalo overflow and read write primitives as eternal romance. Um, you also get the matched pairs and the uh, classic grooming. And I didn't get to go through the classic grooming. Uh, but uh, they inadvertently, with Windows 8, they patched um, the info leak that was in uh, uh, eternal romance. So we can't do uh, the normal eternal romance methodology. Instead, uh, we do our info leak using the eternal champion uh, methodology. Uh, but another thing is the address that we stored our shellcode at last time has became a dep pool, um, which means that it's not an executable. Uh, so we need a new way to find uh, an executable portion of memory. Um, so using our read primitives, same ones as eternal romance, uh, we can read the connections, preferred work queue, um, which is gonna be, uh, uh, it's gonna have on it a, a member called erp thread, uh, which gives us a k thread structure. K threads have a K process. And then K processes have uh, a process uh, list entry, uh, double linked list. Uh, only uh, normally in double linked lists, uh, you know, one goes to one and then going backwards, it, you can traverse back and forth. Um, with the process list entries, it appears uh, to me that uh, as you go forward, you go to the next process. But at each step, if you try and go back, you just go back to the list head uh, instead of being able to go, yeah. Um, and so that list head is actually a global variable inside uh, uh, NTOS kernel. Um, so you just start reading backwards in memory from that global variable uh, until you get to the MZ header. Uh, and then you can parse the, using the rem remote read, you can parse the uh, NTOS kernel uh, PE P headers. And on uh, Windows 8 and 8.1, uh, they have this uh, uh, section inside of NTOS kernel.exe that's just a read write. It's name, the name of the section is read write exec. Um, and so the only thing that's really ever legitimately calling this portion of memory is a function called kx unexpected interrupt. Um, but uh, this is where eternal synergy decides to store the shellcode, um, is right there. Um, so here's some uh, a good list of resources um, for this stuff. I think uh, Sleepia's. Uh, GitHub repo is probably the best if you want to look at this at the code level. Um, and then uh, Nicholas Jolie of uh, MSRC did a sort of a similar talk at HitCon. Um, and then there's, there's some more resources. Uh, Jen Imagius and I's uh, white paper from last year. And then if you're interested on in the Shadow Brokers, there's more stuff on the bottom there, uh, just some archives. And uh, I'll also uh, be at DerbyCon doing kind of like a part two for this. So. That's it. Thank you.